It was pretty exciting that as you guys were continuing to worship in here and Toshe was getting dried off, there were about 10 uh, teenage girls back there in the baptistry area. And I don't know if you heard it or not, but when she came out, there was a great squeal. You might have thought it was a worship team, but there was a great squeal. And so one more time, can we give God praise? It's pretty cool to see... Not only, not only uh, Toshe's excitement, but to see all of her friends celebrating that moment with her and to be very excited as well. I remember when I first, when I first gave my life to Christ, um, I was 17 years old, and uh, just, a, just a new believer in Christ. And one of the questions that I faced many, many times over and over is, you know, God, what, what's your will for my life? And what I meant really by that, God, what, what's your will for my life, is what, what should I do in this situation? You know what I mean? I mean, that's oftentimes what we really mean by that. We kind of come to this point of decision moment and it's like, God, what do you want me to do right here in regard to school or friendships or church or whatever it was? God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And so one of the things, embarrassingly to admit this, one of the things that I would do is I would actually grab a basketball when I'd come to these moments and I would go out to the city park and I would look at the basketball goal and I would stand at the three-point line and I would say, God, if I make this, then this is your will for my life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. I have to tell you that I walked away about 99.9% .9 of the time thinking that whatever it was in front of me, it wasn't God's will for my life. I, I, missed, I missed so consistently that I had to rephrase my questions in order to get the desired result of what I wanted God to do in my life. And I'm so glad that I don't do that anymore, okay? I've moved up to the, to the free throw line a little bit. So, so I moved a <laughs> You know, it's kind of embarrassing to admit that, you know, but I was so young in my faith and I was so desperate to know God's will. And oftentimes when we're so desperate to know God's will, we'll do crazy things, won't we? I had a professor at Ozark Christian College that told me that there was this individual in, in his church and she was so desperate to know the will of God in every facet of her life, even in the clothes that she wore to church on Sunday, that she would close her eyes and she would just reach into her closet and pull out whatever she got her hands on and he said one Sunday she showed up with a skirt on the bottom and a skirt on top as well. <laughs> and it, it sounds crazy to us, but oftentimes, oftentimes when we're desperate to know the will of God, we will look for confirmation in all kinds of crazy ways and crazy places. And you may be there this morning, and not, not wearing two skirts, but you may be there this morning kind of wondering, God, what do you have for my future? Because I don't want to ruin my future. How will this impact my family? God, is it what, what, what do you want me to do in, in my life? And, and the goal of this series, to connect the dots, has been to do a little bit more than throwing up kind of a three-point air ball or maybe just reaching in and grasping at whatever comes our way. The, the idea is to, to really search God's word in his commands, but also in his examples, and, and really to, to help us to understand how we can stop second-guessing what God has called us to do and look to his word confidently as a guide to show us to discover his will for those decision point moments. We started last week with the question, God, you know, how, how can I know the will of God for my life? But really we could shorten it up to this question. How can I know the will of God? Now, you might think those are the same questions, but really they're, they're not. There's a nuanced difference in, in both of those questions. The first one is just focus on yourself, and that's a great question, but really we have to have a better understanding of what God's will is overall. How do we define it? How do we understand it? In, in theological circles, many have come to understand God's will in like three different layers or three different dimensions or three different perspectives. And here's what I mean. Some, some understand it this way, that, that first of all, there's God's revealed will. And we touched on this a little bit last week. And God's revealed will is, is God giving us commands and teachings by his word. So much of what God tells us to do, good or bad, positive or negative, so much of what God tells us to do is written down in black and white and he gives it to us. It's been revealed to us. We know, we don't even have to guess. We know God is telling us in his word. It's revealed to us. The second one is God's permissive will. Now, this one's a little bit tricky, but God's permissive will is how God allows us. He gives us free will. He gives us choice. We're, we're, we have, we have, uh, we're, we're agents who can choose to either accept or reject what God has revealed in his word. An example would be uh, the two greatest commandments is love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And while that's revealed to us, and we know that this is God's desire for us to do, we know that God has given us the freedom, the ability not to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And oftentimes, we fall short of loving our neighbor as we do ourselves. Does that, that make sense? 
So that's God's permissive will. And the, the third one is, is really to understand the third dimension is God's ultimate will. And this is God's sovereign, ultimate plan. This is where he accomplishes his eternal plan for his glory and our good. This is the plan of God that will go on and will take place and will happen unthwarted. Like, like the redemption the redemption of the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Like that plan was going to happen and there was nothing that was going to stop it from happening. God had a plan and it was going to be accomplished. Now, while, while these labels on these concepts are man-made, those three perspectives or three dimensions of God, they're, they're not man-made. Actually, they're, they're present all throughout scripture and you can especially see it at work in one book of the Bible. I mean, they're all over the, the Bible, but in one book we can see all of them at work and it's the book of Jonah. So if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, join me, join me in the book of Jonah for our study this morning. It's a small book, so if you, if you need to use your table of contents, that's okay, you're not cheating, it's okay, right? Uh, unlike the other books of prophecy, we're gonna find that when you read through the four chapters of Jonah, we're not gonna read all through the four chapters, we're gonna hit some highlights. But when you read through it, you'll find that it's more historical and biographical than it is prophetical in structure. There's not a lot of oracles that are given. As a matter of fact, there's really none that are given necessarily in the book of Jonah. We, we're really watching Jonah's life and learning from there. And what we find is God teaches some of his greatest truths to people, individuals like Jonah. And we're going to see he's going to teach us about these three different wills, um, three different dimensions of God's will. But beyond that, we're going to see that God also... For, for that permissive will, for the individual will of what he's calling us to, we're gonna find that, that he begins to introduce us to three dots that, that, we, that we're gonna face in our future that we can't afford to skip out on. These are, these are dots that are gonna connect us to his will and, and we're gonna face them, every one of us. I don't know specifically what those dots will look like, but I do know that you'll face these and, and you can't afford to skip them. And so we're picking up with chapter one, verse one, and here's what it, what it says. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. He said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Let's stop there. Right off the bat, we get a profile of the prophet Jonah through his name. Jonah means dove. It means a messenger of hope and, and peace. It's a symbol. And then Amittai means firmness, faithfulness, and truth. And so we have this, this messenger of peace, but he's coming with truth and firmness. And God's, God's will right here is very clear. We see his revealed will um, for Jonah in his life. He was to be a messenger of peace that was to go and proclaim truth to the city whose wickedness was coming before God. And, and Jonah was perfectly suited for this. He had this unique, perfect fit for this mission to this great city. And Nineveh, it was a great city and in many regards. Today, Nineveh would be Mosul in Iraq. It's still there, but just a different name. And at and its heyday, it was, it was a great city, great in political power, cultural influence, and militaristic strength. But in all of its greatness... What grabbed God's attention the most was its, its wickedness. N Nineveh and Assyria, the, the country surrounding it, Nineveh was its chief city, but it, it, was a, it was a place of idolatry, and it was a place that absolutely devalued life. A conquering city, a brutal city that was renowned for their brutal uh, kind of tactics of war. Here, here's what one ruler, uh, a king named Asher, the ruler of Assyria, um, wrote in, in, eight, in 883 B.C. to 859 B.C. He's already said, he says, I stormed the mountain peaks and took them. In the midst of the mighty mountains, I slaughtered them. With their blood, I dyed the mountains red. Their heads of their warriors, I cut off and formed them into a pillar over against their city. Their young maidens, I burned in fire. I flayed all their chief men and I covered the pillar with their skin. You get the idea. This, this king was a brutal, brutal king. And this was the king that would have ruled during Jonah's youth. All of Jonah's youth, Israel would have guarded themselves against an invasion from Assyria. And yet it was into this, into this city, into the heart of this country, this mortal enemy of God that, that God said, go and preach my word to them because their wickedness is coming up before me. Go, God was very clear in his revealed will to Jonah. He told him to go. 
You know, oftentimes, people wonder, they ask the question, God, what should I do in this situation or that situation? And we touched on it a little bit last week and just at the beginning of service that, that God oftentimes, he gives us a green light. He gives us that, that, that go. We, we know he's revealed it to us in his word. Now, when you open up God's word, you'll see that he oftentimes, he has these precepts. And some of those precepts are setting boundaries of things that we can't do. But if you read throughout the whole Bible, you'll find that there is a collection of things that God says, yes, go do these things. You have a green light. You don't, even, you don't even need to ask my permission. You go for it and you do these things. Green lights to love and to show forgiveness and to be generous. God gives us these, these green lights and he, he wants us to forcefully advance and to move forward. And, and you don't even need to ask. There's some of you here, you see Toshe and you begin to ask, God, God do, you, do you want me to be baptized? And the answer is yes, go for it. I mean, yeah, go. Have you ever been at a, at a stoplight? Maybe you're not paying attention and then, you know, for some reason, like just for a second, it kind of passes by and all of a sudden you look up and the lights turn green, you didn't realize it, and then somebody's honking at you. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, it was probably me and I just want to apologize right now because I, I, I do tend to do that and get a little impatient. But no, it's because you have an expectation, I have an expectation. When there's a green light to go, we all have an expectation that we are to move forward. Now, some of you, you, you see these green lights in God's word, these green dots that God says, yeah, the, answer is, the answer is yes, go forward. It's been clearly revealed, and yet, and yet you're stalled. You're, you're not moving forward. And God is asking you and he's asking me to, to step out in faith and begin to force, forcefully advance forward in what he's, he's calling us to do. Um, I think there's probably at the beginning of a new year, there are some individuals, and this has been exciting for us to see three baptisms last Sunday and another baptism this Sunday, and then after the service, first service this morning, um, some people came up and talked to me, and so we're looking at like two more baptisms by the end of the, end of the month, which is a praise God, amen? That's pretty exciting, yeah. <laughs> a, young lady who's, a young lady who's joined the Marines and really discovered her faith um, as being a part of the Marine Corps, wants to come back and be baptized in our home church here at Gateway. Praise God for that. Isn't it incredible? Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. So, but, but see, here's, here's the thing. That, that, green light, that green light exists for, for all of us. God is telling all of you, there's some of you here that have not made that decision to yield your life to Christ and be buried with him and raised in life. And you're wondering, God, should I do it? Should I not? And God says, yes, it's a green light, go. Some of you are wondering, should I share my faith with my friend or my family member or my coworker? And God says, by all means, there's a green light, go. What, what's keeping you? What are you waiting for? There's some of you say, should I be more generous, maybe with my time or my talents, my tithe? And the, and the answer is yes. God is saying, there's a green light, go. It's, it's very clear and it's been revealed to us. And sometimes we see that it's revealed, but, but we wanna avoid it because we don't necessarily we don't necessarily think it's a great idea in the same way that God thinks it's a great idea. Jonah, Jonah was kind of in that boat, literally and figuratively. Jonah had the revealed word of God, go into Nineveh and preach God's word, but instead of forcefully advancing and going forward, he decided to make a U-turn. Look at verse three, it says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. And he headed down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port and paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Good luck fleeing from the Lord. Let's see how far you get. We, we see here, God was very clear in his revealed will. I want you to go. But, but Jonah got on the ship. He sails in the opposite direction. And this is where we see God's permissive will at work for, for Jonah and, and for us. The Lord gives us all a choice. He gives us free will to accept or to reject his revealed will. And, and listen, as long as, as long as we know that there can be positive or negative consequences with the choices that we make. J Jonah serves as a prime example that we should pause for a moment and think about when God has clearly called us to do what has been revealed in his will and we, we don't do it, what we may be facing and why we aren't willing to go forward with what God has green-lighted and called us to do. Maybe, maybe it's because, like I said, you don't believe what God calls great is necessarily all that great. 
There's a, there's a business book, a business leadership book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. Came out a few years back. And, and um, the thesis of the book, the big idea is that, that many organizations struggle not because they can't differentiate between bad and good. Many of them can see the difference between bad and good. What they have difficulty doing is understanding the difference between good and great. And so they get bogged down by settling for something that is, that's less. And I think this might be the case for, for Jonah right here. He might think he has a good idea, but really he's missing out on the great thing that God has for him. He's not even willing to see it as great. And if you look at chapter one, all through chapter one, God's, God's idea, God's calling to go, his will to go for Jonah, he labels great all over it. He says there's a great city. When he doesn't go to that gritty, he's, great city, he sends a great wind, and then he sends a great storm, and then he sends a great fish. And all Jonah saw, and, and most of that was a big problem, but, but God saw that it was going to be a great blessing that eventually would slow Jonah down. You know, some of you may be running in the opposite direction of what God has clearly revealed in his word for you and for me to do. It, you, you know God, God is telling you to do those things, but, but you've decided to go in a different direction. And what happens, Will, what happens oftentimes is, is God will then send some yellow dots into our life, like, like yellow lights, <laughs> right? When we come to a yellow traffic light, we, we know we're supposed to slow down, <laughs> but some of you take it as a cue just to gun it and just kind of go right through the light. Anybody here besides me? Everybody else is lying. Okay, so it's awesome, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right, so you kind of just, some people just kind of, but really, really the lights are there to make us slow down, to proceed with caution, maybe to take stock in the direction that we're, we're, we're headed and what intersection we're about ready to go through. And God did that for Jonah. God called them, these, 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 these yellow dots, these yellow lights, they were great in God's eyes, but Jonah probably didn't think, see them as, as so great. He got on the ship and he headed out and there was this great wind and this great storm and it was rocking the boat. And the captain got together, he says, the gods are against us, what's going on here? Draw straws to find out who's the culprit and it comes down to, to Jonah and Jonah says, yeah, yeah, it's me. I've been running from God. And they said, well, get that guy off the boat. So they toss him overboard, great idea. Right, and all of a sudden, this big fish swallows up Jonah. This great fish swallows up Jonah. And, and all of a sudden, Jonah has three days and three nights and these specially made accommodations from the Lord <laughs> to slow down and to think. Sometimes when you're not doing the things that you know God has called you to do, you, you will begin to face and experience obstacles, won't you? And you'll be like, God, what, what in the world is going on? Why is this happening? Why, why are you forcing me to stop and, and, and think? And well, God, it's because, because he wants you to slow down and proceed with caution to really evaluate the direction you're headed and to think about if it's the right direction, if it's aligned with his will that has been revealed for you and for me. This is, this is, this is a a place that's uncomfortable and really can be pretty frustrating. We don't like to slow down. We like to be in a hurry. This morning I got up and I was ready to go, right? And, but I couldn't just go. I had to go ahead and scrape off all my windows on my truck. Not only did I have to scrape off my windows, but I had left my truck bed down, right? And so a, a layer of ice and snow on my truck bed. And so I thought, well, I gotta flip up my truck bed as I'm driving. I flipped up my truck bed and the ice had lodged between my truck bed and the actual tailgate. And as I'm flipping up that tailgate, it came completely unhinged. And just fell to the ground. And I was thinking, really, God? And I'm not kidding you. He reminded, he goes, remember that about pausing <laughs> and slowing down? And I was thinking, okay, okay. Give me an opportunity to slow down and begin to think about it and pray for, for congregation, pray for my heart to be right. God slows us down because sometimes we want to forcefully advance and God says, no, you're going in the wrong direction. You need, you need to slow down. And God did slow down, Jonah, in a big way. And here's what happens next. At the end of chapter two and the beginning of chapter three, we're told that the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. It's one of my favorite Bible verses in all of scripture. I don't know, <laughs> just pull no punches, right? A one-way trip on the vomitron right there onto, right onto the shores of Assyria. And, and then picking up chapter three, it says, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. 
go to the city, the great city of Nineveh, and proclaim to it the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Do tell, do tell. You know, if, if you have, a, if you have a, a Bible app, maybe there's a way you can highlight it, or maybe even in your own Bibles, but you, you do well to underline those words a second time. Jonah ran and was prepared to drown in his own disobedience, and yet he got a second chance from God. Aren't you grateful that we serve a God of second chances, amen? That sees us run, and that loves us enough to make us pause, to put those obstacles to slow us down, and that he gives us a second chance to align ourselves with his will, what we know to be his will. Jonah teaches us in this moment that that, that God's big sovereign plan, that his ultimate will, and that's what we see at work here, it will come to a pass. It will, it, will be, it, will, it will happen unthwarted. His eternal purpose, his eternal purpose will, will take place. God's ultimate plan was for Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh and for Nineveh to come to repentance and to turn to him. Now, here's the thing about God's ultimate plan. We don't often know why. Sometimes it's, it's veiled, it's mysterious to us. Isaiah said that his ways are not our ways and his plans are not our plans, that his, his ways are higher than our ways and his plans are higher than our plans. Oftentimes there are things that God, God does or God is accomplishing and we don't quite understand why God, would, why God would want to save the mortal enemies of his people, but he, but he does. He wants them to hear the message and to repent and here's what, what's what happened. In chapter three, verses five and 10, it says, the Ninevites believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when God saw what they did, verse 10 says, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. This is is an amazing turn of events because if you think Jonah, you know, Jonah probably didn't look great. He looked like a homeless person. He probably smelled awful. (laughs) And here he is, he marches into the city and he proclaims a message. And if you, if you read through chapter three, you realize it's a message of about eight words, I think five words in the Hebrew language. It's not really that much. He says, hey, repent or God will bring calamity upon you. I mean, it's really, he doesn't invest much in, in making sure that they would turn. He doesn't say much at all. It's kind of the equivalent of saying the end is near and then that's it. And, and yet they didn't impale him. They didn't run him off. They didn't threaten him. They, they simply believe God. They didn't want to take any chances, and so they decided to hold this, this, this fast and this day of mourning. And, and the scripture says that God saw, saw them, and it wasn't, because of, it wasn't because of Jonah's power of persuasion or any of his words. It was simply because of God's sovereign will at work, his ultimate plan to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Amen? That's how God does it. Jonah didn't understand God's ultimate purpose, and maybe we don't either, maybe not on this side of eternity, but God wanted to save the Ninevites. Jonah, Jonah did have an understanding of the nature of God, and it was one of the reasons that he fled from, from actually going and preaching and proclaiming. This is what he said to the Lord in chapter four after the city has been spared. He says, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah's pretty bent out of shape about this, isn't he? He's pretty bent out of shape that God spared this whole city instead of just nuking them from the, from the face of the earth. He's, he's pretty upset by it. And he makes this request. He makes this request to God. God, I've done what you told me to do. Just kill me now. I don't even want to live and have to think about it any longer. And this is where sometimes God says no. Sometimes you may make a request that serves you, that seems reasonable, and God says no. No. Jonah had more to learn about who God was, about who God loves, and about himself, about how he needed to reflect God a little bit more. And so while God is telling him no, he tells him no through a a living parable. What he he does is he has this this vine just begin to spring up in chapter four, and this vine begins to cover him from the sun that's beating down on Jonah, and Jonah just sets underneath 
the vine, soaking in the shade and resting, looking over at the city of Nineveh. I'm, I'm sure pretty upset about it not being destroyed. And then God makes the vine wither and the harsh sun comes back down upon him and Jonah begins to cry out and complain before the Lord wine, like, hey, why did you take away this vine? And in that moment, God, God shares the lesson. He says, Jonah, you, you have much concern about this vine that, that you didn't cause to grow that you had nothing to do with. And yet I tell you, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, men and women and children and cattle too, that are in the city that have been crying out to me because of the great wickedness. And I'm a compassionate God, loving and abounding in love and mercy. And they're important to me. God, God wanted Jonah to continue to live. He said, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna end your life. I want you to learn and understand that there's a bigger thing, bigger thing, bigger picture at stake here. And I'll, I'll say this morning, there are some of you that are asking God for some things that he's saying no to because they clearly don't align with his revealed will. There, there's some things that you're saying, God, I wanna do this, I wanna do this, and God say, just open up the Bible and you know that I'm not gonna allow that to happen. There's some things that seem a little bit more ambiguous. God. Your word doesn't talk about this, but I, but I want to do this. And God is telling you no. And maybe he's, it's even something that's really good that you desire a family member to be healed. And the answer you seem to be getting is no. And in that moment, God is wanting you to trust that there's a bigger picture involved and there's a bigger purpose, a grander design that has yet to play out. But when we think about it, God even told the father even told his own son no, didn't he? Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane on the night before he would go to the cross, he cried out three different times. He says, Lord, if it's your will, could you take this cup of suffering? The suffering would be the cross that he would endure. If you would take this cup of suffering from me, but yet not as I will, as you will. And as far as we know, as we see the events play out from Good Friday, God said, no, I'm not gonna take this cup of suffering from you. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna have you endure that cup of suffering because there's a bigger picture, a grander design that's at play here. Something needs to be accomplished. And what needs to be accomplished is the salvation of humanity, past, present, and future that includes you. Toshe and the Woodruffs and little Claire Dorn last week and all of us who have said yes to Jesus Christ. There's a bigger, grander design at play when God says no sometimes. When I was 14 years old, three years before I came to Christ, I was really excited about trying out for the basketball team. I was, I was all of four foot five probably, I don't know, I was so short. Spud Webb was my favorite basketball player. I was, I, I just, I, I loved basketball though, and so I was really excited to try out for the freshman basketball team, and I, I lined up with the rest of the guys, and the week before um, school would start for the new school year, and Mr. Russell was, was just an incredible guy, great guy, and after a week of tryouts, Mr. Russell, he came up, and he, he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, Carl, have you ever thought about going out for wrestling? It was Mr. Russell's way of saying no. I'd like to tell you that, that I, I took that moment and I harnessed it and I practiced even harder and I came back and I became the Michael Jordan of Abilene High School, but that would be untrue. That, that didn't happen. Instead, I took his advice. I went out for wrestling. People in my weight class, you know, I think I weighed 103 pounds as a freshman. That's pretty little. I think my daughter's all way more than that at this point, right? And, uh, and I went out for wrestling. And during that time, I built a relationship with a, with a transfer from another small town called Solomon. His name was, was Ryan. And Ryan was, was uh, we were both non-believers. We both didn't have our heads screwed on straight and we partied and did different things. And I remember we were friends freshman year and sophomore year and junior year. And when I came to Christ, you know, we began to move in different directions because we had different, different goals for life. And I remember I was driving down, it was Carrie, I was dating Carrie at the time. He was, at, he was at a house right down the street from Carrie's house and I saw his Mustang, it was a silver and red Mustang and the hood was popped up. And I didn't know anything about cars, but I thought I'm gonna stop by and see how Ryan's doing, offer any help. And so I'm, I'm driving back home from Carrie's house. I see this Mustang, that's 
just pulled over and I get out of the car and say, hey, Ryan, how you doing? He's like, hey, come, what are you doing working on your car? And we're just kind of small talking. And then he goes, hey, what happened to you? Because <laughs> you really got kind of weird. And I said, well, you know, I gave my life to Jesus and I'm trying my best to, to follow him. And it's, it's difficult, but I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to, to understand what God wants for me. And he goes, okay, yeah, yeah. I said, hey, you should, you should come to church with me. You should come to church with me on Sunday. And he said, okay, sure. I said, really? I said, you'll come to church with me. I goes, yeah, on Sunday. Just right down the road here at Emmanuel Church. So he, he promised to come to church with me. And so he did. He showed up on Sunday morning. I was really excited to introduce him to my pastor, Dennis Wallace. And Dennis was just, a, just this great Bible preacher, loved Jesus. Um, there was a potluck dinner right afterwards. And so Dennis grabbed us together real quick. And Dennis just jumped right. He goes, Ryan, he goes, are you, he goes, are you a Christian? And Ryan kind of stepped back. He goes, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of a Christian. And then Dennis asked this nutty question. And I've shared this before. Dennis goes, he goes, Ryan, what do you know about baked potatoes? And I was like, okay. Now I'm kind of semi-embarrassed that I introduced you to Dennis because I don't know where this is going. And he goes, he goes, well, he goes, uh, I, I work at the Kirby house. He goes, well, what do you do with half-baked potato? He goes, well, you throw out a half-baked potato because nobody likes half-baked potatoes. And he goes, you know what? God doesn't like half-baked Christians either. You know, as weird and corny and as Jesus jukey as that was, that penetrated right through Ryan's heart. Ryan, Ryan realized that he was a lukewarm person, that he believed in God, but he wasn't following God with his life. And, and that Sunday, that Sunday from the span of the, the time that we saw midweek to the Sunday, he gave his life, he gave his life to Jesus on that Sunday. And it was amazing. It was amazing. It wouldn't be until years later when I would hear Ryan share his testimony that, that, that God, God would just open up my eyes. Ryan would share that from that time that we, we met midweek to that Sunday, Sunday morning that he'd broke up with his girlfriend and that he, on the Saturday night, he had sat in his house with, with a gun in his mouth ready to end his life. He was so depressed and distraught about his, his, his girlfriend and him breaking up. And he says that in the moment that he was about ready to end his life, he, he remembered, I have to fulfill my promise to go to church with Carl and then I'll do it Sunday night. I'll do it the night afterwards. He said, I'm, just, I'm gonna take care of that and then that'll, I'll, I'll fulfill all my obligations. And so he, he, he came. He came and Dennis asked a crazy question about a baked potato and he gave his life to Jesus. And as I'm, I'm thinking about it now, I just think about how our introduction came about and how it was a no. You're not gonna make it on the basketball team that pointed me towards a wrestling team, that pointed me towards meeting Ryan, who was a new transfer, that pointed me towards building a relationship, that pointed me towards seeing his car pulled over on the side of the road, that pointed me towards inviting him to church, that pointed me towards introducing him to Dennis. And somehow through it all, God has a bigger, grander plan even in the no, amen? This morning, you may be in a place where clearly God is calling you to do something. And I wanna say it's a green light. Don't skip this, do it. Do exactly what God is calling you to do. You may be coming to a place where you realize you're not, you haven't been doing it. God's putting obstacles and you just wanna avoid this yellow light and just burn right through it. God's telling you right now, slow down and begin to evaluate. Evaluate why these obstacles are in your life. And you might be in a place where you're asking God and you're asking God and you're getting a no. And it may be a no for a reason you might never know. But you have to just continue to trust that God has a grander plan and a greater design in place. These are three dots you can't afford to skip. You're gonna all face this. Every one of us is gonna face this in the year to come and in the years to come. And we can't afford to bypass these as we connect to the will of God. Would you stand up? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace in each and every one of our lives. And we pray, Father, this morning that if there's a heart here that hasn't said yes to Jesus, like Toshe and the Woodruffs and Claire Dorn, that, Father God, they would realize that today is the day that you are a God of second chances and you desire for them to, to go. You've given them a green light to come forward and to receive your son as a, as a forgiver of their sins, a rescuer of their souls. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.